Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Crosstalk. Thank you for joining us uh, this Wednesday evening. Um, we're in a rather chilly sanctuary, and we hope you're staying warm uh, wherever you are uh, as we uh, enter into these winter months. Um, so we've been talking about the parables over um, the last few Sundays here at the church, and we're going to move on forward in, uh, through this series. And we've been thinking about Jesus as the world's greatest teacher, among other things, but uh, Jesus had a lot of wisdom uh, to teach us about uh, the nature of God, the nature of human life, and um, just some incredible lessons that we learn. And we learn them through uh, stories. There are lots of different ways we learn, but stories are a good way of, of understanding what Jesus has to say. So we've been focusing on, on the parables. Uh, Nathaniel, just kind of, could you give us a little bit of, um, maybe catch us up on the nature of parables? They're not just stories. Sure. So, um, and before we get to that, what we've been trying to do with our Wednesday crosstalks is sort of give supplementary material that'll help with Sundays without giving away the sermon. Um, as we laughed last week, parables tend to be short and um, to the point. So we don't want to give you the sermon so that you can come again and hear the sermon. <laughs> right. But parables are also tricky. And if we're not careful, we might um, miss the point. Yeah. Um, and there's various ways that we can do that. So one of the things that we talked about last week was um, that parables are not stories about morals or moralizing. They're stories that are told by Jesus to help us understand who God is and what God's kingdom looks like. I think that's another way of saying what does it look like when um, God is uh, ruling and reigning on this earth. Mm. Um, so that's what the parables are about. That's what they tend to be about. Um, also, they, uh, they tend to be kind of at face value. I mean, some of them take a little bit of interpreting, but I think one of the pitfalls that we fall into is trying to read too much into them. Yeah. So they're not allegories they're necessarily. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, this stands for this and this stands for this, and you got to work through all of that process. No, they're short, illustrative stories. So mm -hmm. last week in our church service when we were talking about prayer, uh, Jesus told a parable about a man who received visitors late at night, and he didn't have any food for them, so he went to his neighbor's house, and he banged on the door, and he asked for food, and the neighbor said, go away. And then Jesus said, the man in the house is not going to give his friend food out of goodwill because they're friends, but if he keeps bothering them and is going to wake up the kids, then the guy will get up just to get rid of him. Right, right. And then uh, Jesus says, this is what prayer is like. Does Jesus mean that God is going to uh, give us stuff if we annoy him enough just right. so that we'll shut up? No. His point is, and it's made in the next verse, if human beings who are broken are like this, then how much better will your Father in heaven be who's not broken? Um, so it's possible to read too much into it. It's possible to miss the point. But I think when we're able to see stories in context, um, then we should be able to see a, uh, a pretty sharp point that Jesus is trying to make about who this God is that we're trying to serve and uh, what we can expect from this God. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really true. I mean, they have a point, but I also think, you know, it, 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 it's good to live with them a little while sure. and, and to, to meditate on it, to think about it, um, because I think sometimes we jump to some conclusions that may be partial illustrations. And I think the, the, the parable coming up this Sunday is a really good illustration of that. Uh, it's a longer story we're gonna be talking about. Sometimes it's called the waiting father, sometimes the prodigal son. Um, but sometimes the two sons. The two sons. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's easy to maybe move to one part of the story and, and not wait to to the end to really get to the to the sure. punchline, so they I think the parables do challenge us to to really think about them. Sure, and um, in connection with everything that we're saying, parables are often um, calculated to catch people off guard and to present them with an, an idea that they might not otherwise like or accept. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we're going today. Last week we talked about what parables are and how they work. 
This week we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about audience because it matters who the story is being told to as to what the interpretation might be, and we'll discover this big time on Sunday. So um, I guess what we want to do over the next couple minutes is just spend some time. Um, this probably is review for some of you, but who are the kinds of people that would have come out to listen to Jesus, and who are the kinds of people that Jesus would have been teaching? Yeah. Um, it's cliched, but I don't think that we can say it enough that the world that Jesus was born into, um, the Middle East, Palestine, in the first century AD, was a wild time and place uh, to be alive. Do you want to say anything about that quickly? Well, wild in the sense that... It, Israel at, the, at this point is not um, is not a you know just a provincial backwater. I mean, it's sort of the crossroads of empires. The Romans are coming in. They've had a, some years of um, Hellenistic influence after Alexander the Great. Um, so you have you know the pressure of these new ideas coming in. Not to mention all the economic trade issues that are wound up in all of this and then you have the religious sort of take on all of this you have the jewish people divided amongst themselves even religiously how they're dealing with all of the transition all of the change and so you have what today we might call religious liberals and uh, you know religious conservatives and so all of these conversations are swirling in a very complex world that, as you've said before, is not a lot different, I think, in, in many ways of the, the kind of <clears throat> cultural transitions that we live in today, this kind of global culture. Yeah, so bear with me as I kind of work this idea out, but um, one of the things that we see today when we look on the news is that um, Islam is in a interesting place, um, and it's very tied up with geography. There are some places in the Islamic world, like uh, Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates, that occupy a strange middle ground. Um, there's a lot of excess and indulgement in, in capitalism, but uh, until just recently, women were not allowed to have driver's licenses in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a, a direct offshoot of uh, Islamic life and Sharia law, which is um, Islamic law. It would be kind of like the Islamic equivalent to Torah. Um, and then uh, we see that, that Islam is dealing with Western influence in different ways in Africa. It's dealing with it in certain ways in Central Africa, other ways in Northern Africa, dealing with it in certain ways in uh, Arabia, um, certain ways in Afghanistan, Pakistan. And going west, different ways in Turkey, I think, you know, that's another example of absolutely trying to work this out. Absolutely. In Turkey, you have another interesting um, example of a country that in some ways looks western, sort of a, a capitalist model, but in other ways is ultra conservative compared to us. And that, again, is a direct offshoot of this conversation that they're having with Islamic faith. And um, particularly in places like Syria, um, anywhere that uh, militant Islam has come to the fore, actually, you know, all the way over like Indonesia, this is yeah, becoming oh, sure, a topic. Sure. Um, the response is from people who are deeply conservative um, Muslims, uh, how do we deal with a modern world and what do we reject and how hard do we reject it and what do we stand for? And what that has led to is a lot of conversation within Islam, but also a lot of conflict with the Western world. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's as simple as yelling matches over who wears a hijab and not. But sometimes it bleeds over into to absolute violence and chaos. Yeah. Uh, the world that we see today that is influenced by that conversation by Islam in Jesus' day was the same world, but it was influenced by the conversation with Jewish faith. And what does it mean to be a Jewish person? And the exact same conversations were happening, and the exact same reactions were happening. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful analogy to 
help us sort of transcend the academic, like, oh, there are Sadducees and Pharisees and Zealots. And I mean, you know, those are words, but you know, when we see the complexity of it being worked out uh, in the Islamic world, I think that really brings it to life for yeah. me. Well, I mean, that is exactly what Jesus was born into. Um, and this um, struggle had begun about 300 years before Jesus, when Alexander the Great had marched with his Greek armies all the way to India, and in the process introduced a very uh, liberal, um, open uh, morality, relativistic culture into the Middle East. Yeah. And some people liked it and some people hated it. And this was constant friction for years and years and years. And, I, you know, I, again, I just uh, think that there are, you got all this religious, you know, we, we kind of put that in a, a compartment. But you've got all this economic and political flux as well. Oh, I sure. mean, there's it's just, who's making money off of the system, too. So, yeah, there's. But what, you, what you tend to find is you find uh, conservative hardliners who made money on the old system, and then you find liberal people who've made a lot of money on the new system. system. Yeah. And then you got everybody else just trying to figure out yeah, so what all, in the world am I supposed to do? <laughs> all, all of this stuff is boiling. I mean, it's just, you know, it's hard to pull out one strand and go, oh, you know, yeah. is this all this boil. But take us back into Jesus. But, but the voices that we get in Scripture and the voices that we get in the Catholic Bible that we don't get in the Protestant Bible, which is a shame, from the Old Testament Apocrypha, is uh, the conversations of God's faithful people. How are, how are we going to deal with this? One of the great hopes happened... And you're, you're talking about the Apocrypha. You're talking about that intertestament period. Old Testament Apocrypha is different than New Testament Apocrypha. Yeah. So the Old Testament Apocrypha is the books that were written between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. That the Catholic Church still includes in the Bible, which is a good idea. Um, we don't. New Testament Apocrypha is completely different, and nobody includes those in their Bible. Yeah. Anyway, one of the great hopes was about 160 years before Jesus, the Maccabean Revolt. Um, this is where the story of Hanukkah comes from. And it looked like a glimmer of light where the Jewish people, Jewish conservatives, who were interested deeply in the law, uh, deeply in following God well, were able to take control of their own government, were able to take control of their own land. And the hope was, maybe we can get this thing back on track. Mm. Um, but we find out quickly that that's not true. And the end of that story is the Herods right. that we meet that Jesus uh, has to deal with. Um, also, about 60 years before Jesus, the experiment really died because the Roman government came in. Um, in 64, Pompey the Great um, invaded, and um, he was on a much bigger mission to go through Syria. But he stopped in Jerusalem and he claimed the town for Rome, and he himself went in the Holy of Holies in the temple, and this was kind of like a, oh crap, moment for the Jewish world. And uh, so this is the environment that Jesus is born into, and the people that Jesus is talking to, I think it's really important um, to think about. If we think about our society today, there's a lot of people who are angry, um, but there are not a lot of people who are searching. And that might not sound popular. I know that we love to say from the pulpit that people are searching. They are not. No. People That's don't right. care what you have to say. They just know that they're angry. Um, they're, they're, they know that they're angry and they have the Internet and they know more than everybody else about anything. Right, right. They're the experts. <laughs> yeah. But this, this is a crazy culture. It is, but this is not really the people that we meet in Jesus' day. We find a people who are angry, who are anxious, who are frightened and concerned, but also a people who really do want answers. So I think it's important that Jesus' ministry is predated or preceded by John's ministry. Mm. And um, John has a ministry that's focused towards Jerusalem, but it's really for all of Judea, all of Palestine. And um, John calls out to all kinds of people, and his message is very basic. Um, repent. That's as <laughs> about as, about as uh, long as it gets. This is from Luke chapter 3. Uh, 
John went into the country all around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The crowds that were coming out to be baptized to them, this is what John said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The people asked, What should we do? And John said, The man with two tunics should give one to a person who doesn't have any, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked John, Teacher, what should we do? And he said, Don't collect more than you're required to. Then some soldiers asked, What do we do? And he said, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and all wondering if their hearts, if John might possibly be the Christ. So that right there introduces us into this really incredible time in this really incredible place um, with all different kinds of people who were um, seeking, hoping for something. Um, John talks about destruction. I think that it is far too easy for us um, as Protestants, um, as evangelicals, to over-spiritualize that. Given the context that we just talked about, Roman power, the anxiety over uh, political um, well-being, and the reality that in uh, shortly after Jesus' lifetime, the Romans will come in and destroy yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah. The, the destruction that John is talking about is very real. This is not some sort of existential crisis. This is a, <laughs> we're all going down if we don't straighten things out. Right, right. Wow. So, yeah, it's not an over-spiritualizing. It's, it's, a, it's a visceral life reality yeah. that John is talking about. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, all different kinds of people are coming out, and they're hoping that John might be the one. They all have in the back of their mind this ancient hope. Um, that God would send a king who would set people free and all this stuff. It's interesting, and I, I don't want to make him a guru, but I, I've enjoyed reading Dallas Willard lately, and there are a lot of different ways that we can think about repentance. You know, turning is the, the basic kind of meaning. Um, turning toward Christ, I've always felt, is, is appropriate when we think of it's not just turning around, it's turning toward Jesus and his teaching. Uh, but Dallas Willard talks about repentance as, in terms of changing one's mind. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like that because it seems like uh, John is coming and saying, you know, everybody needs to, everybody needs to change their mind. Where, wherever you are in this mix, you know, wherever you find yourself on the map, you need to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, myself included, I like to seek out teachers that confirm what I think. And I'm going, yeah, you're, you're, you're right, because I think that. Um, so John is preparing the way for Jesus to, for everybody to sort of take a, a check and, and to change one's mind. So um, I think maybe that's one of the roles of the parables is to help us all, wherever we find ourselves, change our mind about something. Um, so anyway, I, I just, yeah. I like that idea of, of changing the mind. Yeah. So um, the point that I'm trying to get at here, too, is, um, yes, there are many different people that come to listen to John, and there are many of those people come to listen to Jesus after John is mm -hmm. arrested. Um, but again, they tend to come out of this conservative background. They're conservative people who are looking for real concrete answers. What's going to happen in our future? And so they've come out to look to authority to answer those questions for them. Um, when we look at the parables, it's interesting, um, a couple weeks ago we talked about Matthew 13, and uh, it says that Jesus taught the crowds in parables, and the disciples ask him why he does that. And he gives them the answer from Isaiah. But interestingly, when we keep reading, more often than not, Jesus is not just talking to crowds in parables. More often than not, he's talking to specific people in answering specific questions, and sometimes that's the disciples. More often than not, Jesus is speaking in parables to this group of people called the teachers of the law mm. um, or the temple authorities. Those are the two groups that Jesus really seems to pull the parables on more often than not. 
Would, would you say it's fair uh, to, to say that um, in, his, in his early ministries, the, the kingdom parables, the seeds, the, the pearl of great price, the treasure, that might be more of a general teaching, but as, as Jesus moves on toward Jerusalem, uh, particularly, you know, you get in Matthew, you know, you get those two chunks, Matthew 13, Matthew 24, 25. 24, 25, he is not talking to crowds. He's mm -hmm. not talking about the kingdom of God. He has a very specific audience. And it seems like you're saying, and I think it's true as we read these parables to keep in mind this movement, and increasingly he's going to be talking to these conservative people, the Pharisees, mm -hmm. the teachers of law, and that sort of yeah. thing. <clears throat> the reason that I think this is so important is because, um, again, this is an evangelical thing. Um, we tend to be a people who are um, intensely aware of our guilt, I think, probably. And sometimes that's more heartfelt than others. But I think every evangelical knows, everybody who's ever heard Billy Graham or Franklin Lamb knows, I'm a sinner. Um, and so we tend to come at the parables like we're from the left. Yeah. yeah. And we tend to really latch on to parables of grace about how big God's heart is. But Jesus wasn't telling those parables to people who were from the left. Jesus was telling those stories to people from the right. Yeah. And he was telling them for a specific reason. Um, and more often it boils down to what's your problem? Um, why do you not like this? People, conservative people, why don't you like it? Um, and that's really, really interesting because for me, it recasts a lot of the parables. So he's asking conservative people, why don't they like the kingdom? Yeah. What, and, why, what about God bothers you so much? <laughs> and, and, and what about, I guess, more specifically, God revealed in Jesus? So Jesus was going around healing people. He was casting out demons. He was feeding people that were hungry. He was forgiving sins, and they had a problem with and all it of that. Bought, and, it, and they decided that he had to die because of it. Yeah. That's so unbelievable. It is. But um, <clears throat> again, for me, that changes so many of the parables. Um, and it becomes very important to me for our context now, because I would consider myself a fairly conservative person on the broad spectrum of things. I would consider myself a, a, a conservative person. I think that families are important. Um, I think that governments are there to protect people from themselves. I think um, protection is important. That's a pretty conservative idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Religion is, you know, Christian faith is, is good. Christian yeah. faith is absolutely. Yeah. I believe in truth. Yeah. Um, I believe in um, objective reality. All deeply conservative ideas. Yeah. Um, um, and it's important for me uh, sometimes to be honest about that. And I like to hear parables about God's grace and how God lets me off the hook. But I don't like to hear about parables where God wants to hold me accountable. Mm. And that seems to be where Jesus is really going with a lot of these. You are accountable to God. You don't think you are, but you are. And you need to take it seriously. And uh, I think that's a message that we miss again and again and again and again in the evangelical church. So Jesus is even telling um, good c conservative people, you're accountable. Yeah. So let's go back to the crowds of people that Jesus is talking wow. to. Yeah. Interestingly, in the Gospels, um, <clears throat> I, I think often we get this idea from TV shows or Sunday school material or whatever that... Jesus was talking to a lot of blue-collar people all the time. Blue-collar people don't exist anymore. But, um, you know, just normal Joe Schmoes. Um, and that may be so, but the scriptures are never really that specific. The um, gospels just say the crowd. And uh, uh, whoever's in the crowd. But we learn from Josephus that um, there were some major movements, some major people groups in Jesus' day. Josephus was rough contemporary of Paul and um, an important Jewish figure and writer. And uh, he says that there are, we might think about them as the liberals and the conservatives of today. You've got the liberals who, um, they're the Romanizers. They're the ones who are comfortable. Whatever the Gentiles want to do, we just want to keep peace. Don't stir the pot. It's economically advantageous not to stir the pot. Just be cool. 
Um, and then on the other side, the sort of conservative camp is broken up into several different groups. You have the group that is deeply committed to the uh, political life of the nation of Judea, um, and they're deeply connected to the temple. This is the chief priest and um, most of the priestly establishment who's established around the temple in Jerusalem. We have to remember that throughout Jesus' whole ministry, Herod has been rebuilding the temple to become one of the wonders of the world. Um, so it's a big deal, a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of administration. Um, you have the crazy violent people, the zealots, who just want to burn everything down in the name of faith, whether it is or not. Right. And then you have this other group that tends, that seems to be the larger group by far, and um, they're the Pharisees, and we've talked about them before. They're a lot like who we know as Gideons today. They're lay people who are deeply concerned about knowing God's word and making it real in their lives. They are eminently decent people mm. and eminently reasonable people. You don't tend to find Pharisees who are zealots. They don't want to kill people. They want to live a life of integrity. And you don't tend to find Pharisees who have been uh, duped into supporting a, a, a broken nihilistic political system. Again, they just want to live lives of integrity. And these are the people that Jesus is always calling into accountability. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, as you describe that, I find myself there with the Pharisees. Yeah. And deeply concerned, deeply concerned, deeply anxious. And Jesus is telling these, these stories, particularly as we get later in his ministry. And um, it, it seems like Jesus is working in, in, in two sort of areas. In, in one sense, the, the parables are deeply challenging. They're, they're calling these people into accountability. But I don't, I don't sense that Jesus is scolding them. Mm. Um, I, I, get, I get the sense that he's challenging them. But, but there's another part of the parable, and this is what makes them so interesting, is that it's, it's, it's reassuring that, you know, here's a truth here that, that, that is deeply assuring that will hold you in these troubled times, but you have to take the challenge with it. So as I read these parables, I find myself sort of going between, well, you know, as you say, I, I, I would love a parable. Well, God just loves everybody, and you can just forget what you do. Yeah. And just do good, whatever you Good thing I'm off the hook. Yeah, yeah, parables of grace, how wonderful that is. Jesus doesn't allow us to go there, but, but neither is he scolding, neither is he taking away hope. He's just giving us this, this incredible message. If we'll receive the right hand and the left hand, we'll find that door into the kingdom. Absolutely, absolutely. And again... In context, in uh, real life, very troubled times, very anxious times that Jesus was ministering in. And the invitation into the kingdom is not some overly spiritualized thing. Um, it's very real day-to-day -day kind of stuff. Yeah. So, why do we say all this and why are we beating the drum? Well, my challenge for you, if you've made it this far is to go ahead and read our parable for Sunday. It is going to be the uh, prodigal son, because that's what everybody knows it as. And uh, read it with this in mind. Jesus is not talking to liberal people to tell them they're off the hook. He's talking to conservative people to remind them of their responsibilities. And you're probably going to guess everything that I'm saying in the sermon anyway, but that's your homework. The second thing for me is, as we think about this year, and as I think about the, the future of our church and our ministry, and what is God calling us to do, I, um, I find myself with questions, but I also find myself with hope and new ideas and new directions. And um, We are reading a book with the Board of Elders this year, the conversation between Dallas Willard and um, John Ortberg. Um, if you are interested in it, let us know. We'll get you the name of it, and you can get it yourself. But one of the things that I thought was so fun at the beginning of the book is that Dallas Willard says that faith in Christ um, is about making disciples out of other people. And he had this shocking statement. He said, the best place in the United States to go to make disciples for Jesus is the church. 
because the people there already want to be disciples. <laughs> right, right. And that reminds me of this idea that Jesus had. Jesus did not spend time trying to go to unchurched people to convince them of the truth. He went to people who are already in church, and he tried to show them who God really was yeah. very often. And uh, what an incredible invitation, challenge, uh, for us as a people at Trinity Church to um, be a place where people who have grown up in the church, who, who know the good news about Jesus, that they've been forgiven and that God wants to love them, w what an incredible privilege to help people see on a deeper level, this is who God and this is God is and what God wants, to, to become not just people who've heard it, but who know it and who do it. That's an incredible invitation. Yeah. And, and, you know, N.T. Wright comments on this in, in several places that so many people in the church, they, they genuinely have faith in Christ. They, they've been saved. They know they're going to heaven. But the big question is, okay, I've been saved and, you know, I've got some years before I go to heaven. What happens? And I think that's what we're talking about, you know, this, this, this discipleship of, of learning what all of this means as we live eternal life now preparing for eternal life forever um so that's that's what we're after yeah. in discipleship and we might you might this might end up getting edited out and this might be my last cross talk i don't know but um i think that there is a strong uh tendency with christians today conservative people today to say the problem is godless liberals they're the problem and if we can just convert the godless liberals and everything will be okay and what jesus pointed to in his ministry is yeah the godless liberals are a problem but self-righteous conservatives are also a problem and they're doing as much damage to themselves and to god's work in the world around them as the godless liberals are yeah. and we all need this constant call back to this is who god is and this is what god is making me responsible for what an incredible thing to hear. It, it, this constant challenge to change one's mind. You know, life is, is, is not static. Um, the challenges of the 60s and 70s are not the challenges of, of uh, the 21st century, 20, 20 and 2030. I mean, we, you know, we're facing new challenges, so we're constantly having to change our minds and constantly having to come back uh, to the centrality of, the, of Jesus Christ as teacher, as savior, uh, always, always, always uh, readjusting and moving forward. One of the things though that encourages me as Jesus spoke into this environment, um, it, you know, it's, it's easy to get focused on the left, the right, the, um, you know, the, it was the teachers of the law that were there at the foot of the cross mocking Jesus and that is such a heartbreaking picture but but we also find if we're patient um, that there are those people that made their way into the Jesus movement and they, they were out of this group you read it specifically in Acts you know on that day many people came into the faith many of them who were priests in the temple many of them who were Pharisees themselves. Yeah, so they, they formed the, the core of this. I mean, I think of people like Nicodemus who was there caring for Jesus after his death. And, um, and then the, the, the ultimate kind of evangelist, the Apostle Paul came out of that, that movement too. So, I mean, I think there's real hope as Jesus addressed that audience. Again, not just scolding, but but offering, you know, the, the assurance as well as the challenge. There were, there were many who said, okay, we, we get it. We, we heard the parable. And I think that's what we're after these, these next few weeks as we sort of, it's helped me to live with the parables mm -hmm. because I've, you know, been reading for many years as we've read the Bible and yeah, that's a nice parable, but to really just sort of focus in you know on the parables not the individual parables the parables is sort of a genre uh, it's been so helpful for me to, yeah. to, to think about this and to as we go through these turbulent times to readjust focus on christ and move forward in the kingdom yeah. <clears throat> just uh one final you know idea for me and perspective and hopes and what do we 
what do we look for? Um, we do find ourselves in anxious times, and I'm frightened about the future, and um, I don't see either side acting very well or giving very good answers. <laughs> that was true in Jesus' day. Um, the repentance that John called for and the destruction that John um, warned of were very real. These were not overly spiritual ideas. These were spiritual ideas working out in real life. And mm -hmm. shortly after Jesus' ministry, a horrible thing happened. In 70 AD, the Romans did come in and they did destroy Jerusalem and the temple hasn't been rebuilt since. 2,000 years. That's a pretty hard butt kicking. Um, I see us, you know, as a nation, as a people, heading down that same road. Where's the hope? How did it turn out? Well, it's interesting. Um, of all the people who made it out of the destruction that happened in 70 AD, there was this little group called the church who understood that their fight was not against flesh and blood, who understood that their job was to love their enemies and not fight after them. And in their wisdom, they, they got out. And instead of dying a fiery death at the hands of the Romans in bloody rebellion, they found a way to transform Roman life from the inside. Yeah. So wow. what do we look for? What do we hope for? I don't know where things are going. They probably will all blow up. However, God will preserve through these faithful people, um, these people who have reoriented themselves to who God really is and what God is really up to, and, and use them to sow the, sow the seeds of new life. It's an incredible story and an incredible hope. I, I would look forward sometime to explore that um, historical reality of the Christians finding their way out of Jerusalem into the diaspora. Those are the people that Paul met. Those are the people that advanced the faith. Absolutely. And that's it. But there's one thing that we have, we, we left out of all of this. Mm -hmm. And we'll end on this. If you want to read the parable of the prodigal son, it's found in Luke oh. 15. <laughs> yeah. Luke chapter 15. There are a couple of good parables before that about lost things. And then uh, you'll find uh, the prodigal son in Luke 15. That's all I got. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you for joining us. And uh, please do uh, either join us online um, as we stream on Sunday morning or uh, come and check us out if you're in Greensboro. We'd love to say hello to you here at, uh, at Trinity Church. Pray us out. Absolutely. Father, again, we give you great thanks that uh, the world and its future is not left up to us and our best ideas and our best efforts. Uh, but instead, you have a plan for where you are taking things. Um, and by your will and by your power, it will be accomplished. Thank you also for the invitation that you extend to us, that you want us to be a part of that reality, both now and in the future. Um, and the promise that if we join you in our work, in your work now, then you will make a place for us in your future, and not even death will keep you from doing that. Help us to hear this good news and to take it seriously, uh, seriously enough that it changes the way that we see the world around us, that it changes our hopes and our desires, um, because this is the only hope uh, for us and for the world around us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Thanks, Nate. See y'all soon. Bye.